From Rixie, this is Frameform, a show about movies, moving, and everything in between. I'm Hannah Weber. I'm Jen Ray. And I'm Claire Schweitzer. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Frameform. This week, we're presenting an interview with George Turnbull, an award-winning stage and screen scholar and practitioner. He is currently a PhD student in the Cinema and Media Studies program at York University, where he's the president of the Graduate Film Student Association and co-founder and vice president of the York University Film Society. Today, we are discussing his film ID, a one-minute silent film shot on 16 millimeter that subtextually explores concepts of gender confusion and defiance of the camera's gaze. This interview was recorded in August 2019 at the Cascadia Dance and Cinema Festival in Vancouver in association with Screen Dance Forum. This interview was conducted by me, Claire Schweitzer, and Karen Jensen, founder and director of Screen Dance Forum. Enjoy. George, thanks so much for being with us today. But my pleasure. I, I'm very, I'm thrilled to be here from Toronto. I don't get many opportunities to come to Vancouver, and I'm really happy I'm here when the weather's nice because sometimes it's not so nice, but it's nice today. So. Oh, good. The the weather gods were smiling upon you. Today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. Well, you know what? We have lots to ask you, but one of our first questions is: is How do you pronounce the name of your film? Uh, ID. Not so, id. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, to be honest with you, when I had first conceived of the film, um, it really has two different titles. So th- the one that's it's widely known as is ID, but I thought of as well Identity Crisis. So depending on when it was submitted to a festival or when, when it was played, when it was edited, sometimes it's you'll see the title as Identity Crisis and other times you'll see it as ID, which is how, it, how it's being shown at Cascadia. Awesome. Yeah, we've had, we have, we've had a couple conversations predicting how one could and should read it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you definitely read it in different ways depending on how you pronounce the title as well. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and your background in dance and, and in film. So I'm George, um, as as you know. Uh, I'm from Toronto. I grew up in Toronto. Um, I started at an arts high school, uh, Topical School of the Arts, where I majored in film. Um, so that's how I got really my foot into the film industry. Um, starting in high school. I should also say I grew up as a competitive dancer with the Chambetelier Academy of Dance and also in Toronto uh, and competed all over the U.S. and Canada as well. So combining those two passions, I went into university, Queen's University, which is in Ontario, uh, majored in film, still did a lot of dance work, and then I did some work out in L.A. uh, at California Institute of the Arts, which is actually where I made this film, uh, and UCLA over there. And then I came back and graduated from Queens as a film major. Uh, Then I went on to do my master's in film, radio, media, television, arts uh, at Ryerson University in Toronto, graduated from there. And now I'm going into the second year of my PhD program at York University in Toronto in cinema and media studies. It was hard for me at the beginning to decide whether I would pick the dance path or the film path. And so I've sort of gone along the film path while still combining my passions. So for my doctorate, I'm actually specifically focusing on dance films or screen dance films. Uh, So I'm still very engaged with both art forms. Um, And also I'm on the editorial board for uh, The Dance Current, which is Canada's leading national dance uh, publication. Just curious, like what are you focusing your research in regarding screen dance? Yeah, so actually, so York is very interested in um, expanded cinema or other types of media. Um, So specifically, I'm looking at the potential effects of uh, dance video games uh, and the potential that it can have on the positive potential it could have on senior citizens health and fitness um, so I have worked for the last five years uh, as the audiovisual director at a church in Toronto um, so I've d- I've worked quite substantially with seniors in the area and also my mother is over 65 so she's considered a senior and so 
I know that they we did sort of a um a little study to a little poll to decide what we could do more in the church to engage seniors, and a lot of them said they would like to participate in more dance related activities. So I thought, okay, so what is the what are the possibilities of dance and screen dance in relationship to seniors, and how might that help them with their mental abilities, their cognitive abilities, their fitness levels, how, how could, what effect, what potential does this have? So that's really what my doctorate is studying. Excellent. And what kinds of video games are you discussing? Like, are you dealing with immersive media or like virtual reality? So, so virtual, re- everything that you just said, virtual reality, but I'm also looking at specifically uh, popular forms of dance video games. So like, I'm sure you've heard of like Just Dance, for example, right. yeah. <laughs> for Xbox and we, those, so I, I'm looking at what, what are the possibilities of, of those types of video games, but also on a related topic, I don't know if you're familiar with hyper choreography. Oh, yeah. uh, Dr. Harmony Bench at Ohio oh, State yeah. University. Oh, yes. Yep, she, mm-hmm. she, yep, she's big fan. <laughs> she, she, she's uh, she's the queen of hyper choreography. I would say she knows the most about it. I so I've been in communication with her as well about that, uh, and the potential of that uh, being integrated into uh, video game design uh, for seniors as well. So that should be really interesting. Yeah, well, I, I'm just going into my second year and I've, yeah, so it's it's still in the early stages, but I've certainly been in contact with the people I need to be, so. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, ageism and dance, no matter what the, the population is a really fascinating field, whether it's the aging dancer or the the seniors involved with dance and how that affects their cognitive and physical abilities. For so sure. that's awesome. So tell us a little bit about what inspired you to do this particular film? What was your motivation? So ID was inspired by, I guess, my fascination with pop culture. So I'm also on the other hand, so although that's my my doctoral dissertation piece, um, I've also contemplated doing a doctoral dissertation on uh, popular forms of dance films. So of dance in Hollywood musicals, but also more specifically early dance films. Um, So like Busby Berkeley style dance films. Um, So I would say that this particular film came out of my fascination with pop culture and the effects and impact of pop culture on one's own identity. So in my film, you, you would see that I'm sort of wearing this like really experimental type of costume with a big star over my eye and it's sort of playing with the viewers i guess conception of what of of what i guess what it means to be in, engaged with popular forms of media so i would so it's i mean there are some like really experimental shots where it's just my head and i'm just yeah. doing like these little hand movements but it's it's also I'm directly staring into the camera as well. So it's like, I guess the charisma that um, some of these very big celebrities can have on us and what does that mean? Um, So, but, but then pushing it like to a really extreme point where it's just almost absurd. So uh, this might answer a future question, but which is also why I actually filmed the dance in reverse. So it, so a lot of the movement looks really, really weird. Oh, and wow. but just to, as I said, just to further punch out this like, this idea. Actually, there's a theory in cinema and media studies called the spectacle theory. Which mm-hmm. so it's like this idea of like watching something that's purely for spectacle purposes. So that so playing around with those types of ideas is what inspired me to create that film. Also, though, I, I would say it, it, um, to further emphasize that uh, it was a project that I had to do on a 16 millimeter format for California Institute of the Arts. Okay. So that film was originally shot on 16 millimeter film, black and white, and then telecined into a digital format. So again, going back to the roots of Busby Berkeley and 16 millimeter super 35 formats of um, dance films and those so those stylistic references as well excellent you actually just answered the question i was about to ask so thank you thank you very much for that um but i actually wanted to also um ask another question um regarding 
um, sort of this homage to early filmmaking, yeah. not just um, popular filmmaking like the Busby Berkeley types, but also the early days of screen dance with Maya Darren. In particular, um, in the work of Maya Darren, uh, silence was used, um, well, partially um, as a practical measure because sound equipment was very expensive in those days. But in Meshes of the Afternoon, for instance, the film is completely silent. And arguably that emphasizes the intention of the film. Like it emphasizes the physicality and it emphasizes the rhythmic editing of the work. Exactly. Um, can you elaborate on your decision not to use sound? Like, was there ever a point where you scored the film with sound? So that's a very good question. So yes, so the original edit of the film did have sound, but it was like, so another love of mine in cinema and media studies is horror films. So <laughs> so I had like this really creepy, like this original sound design, but you know, at the, at some point I realized that it was, I, I, I watched it, I sat back and watched it and I was like, is it more effective with this sound design or is it more effective without it? And I think because it's so short, it's a one minute piece in some, in some audiences, I think um, some feedback I received was that the sound design was a little bit, it, it, it was like these like screeching violins. It, it was, it was pretty, pretty dramatic. So I, I received very mixed feedback on the sound design and ch decided to scrap it completely because when I watched it without, I thought it was uh, much more contemplative. And also it, it, the sound design was pushing it a little bit too far, I think. Uh, but then after studying Maya Deer, and I realized that it could also be considered a reference to her work with no sound. Uh, yeah. So, and, and I think, as, as you said, you know, it being a, a black and white 16 millimeter film, I think it suits that style of film when there wasn't post uh, pre sound. Right. Right. So, so I would say the decision to go without sound was a conscious decision that I made because I felt that it wasn't actually adding to the film, and I right. just sat better with the viewer without it. Yeah. yeah I, I, if if you could hear the sound design, you, you, I don't know how you would feel. It was very, very experimental. Right. <laughs> so. Well, it's it's funny because you'll often go on YouTube and you can even search like my Darren meshes of the afternoon, and you'll come up with like five different like versions Earth, where yeah. people have actually scored they sound. To, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They and. I was talking with someone, even if you try to uh, like bully an environmental sound, it would completely take away from the intention of the film, the, from the effect of the film. Right. And that like really in order to appreciate what she's trying to do, you really have to be in that contemplative state. Exactly. It's, it's more, it's, it's more engaging without it as opposed to with it in, in my piece. I, I completely agree. So most screen dance films are typically five minutes or under. And yours is one. 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 <laughs> and, you know, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. And I think I've gotten some more insights based on that this was done on 16 mm -hmm. millimeters. Yeah. So tell us, what was the intent of having this short nugget of a, of a film so, and why it wasn't expanded? So part of it, Karen, was <laughs> obviously shooting on 60 millimeter film. You're limited, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> film is so expensive. So it's like also just the practical constrictions of what the materials I was given because I was just given the 16 millimeter film from the school uh, and then took the camera out. Uh, and then actually I brought it back to Toronto, where, which is where I filmed it and then uh, had everything else processed in Los Angeles. So part of it was a practical problem because I just didn't, I, I so I knew how much film I had and approximately how much I could f shoot with that length of film because 60 millimeter film has a designated length obviously before it mm -hmm. runs out. Um, and then so I had to strategically plan out, okay, if I have three minutes worth of 16, mm 16 millimeter film, how am I going to organize myself so I can use it efficiently. So I had to think, okay, I can really only choreograph a one minute dance piece. So that will take up the first minute of the 16 millimeter film. And then if I want to do all of these extra, extra little bits, uh, then I have two minutes left to use. Um, so mainly I would say it was a practical thing, but it was also supp supposed to be designed because there are some film festivals that are 
specifically designated for like they're called 60 second film festivals right. so yeah. it was designed for those types of film festivals as well mm-hmm. um but also i'm in my research i've also done a lot of studies with youth and youth engagement as well in media and media content right. so uh, um you know i didn't want it to be too long to the point where a younger viewer would just doze off and fall asleep um, so I wanted it to be short enough that it could be incorporated into specific designated film festivals beyond right. screen dance festivals, um, but also still get the message across in a very sh- um, efficient manner that is still effective. Um, but uh, I guess I would I guess I would say I would rather have a one minute quality piece than a five minute low quality piece right. you know what quality over quantity so that's real that's another reason why i chose to keep it very short yeah, yeah. She, the director of the festival i work for I, i've always kept these words in my mind that you know a two minute film has to be twice as good as a one minute film exactly because it's longer it has to keep people's attention longer i do want to comment uh, again on film length because typically when we think screen dance we think of screen dance shorts which are sub five minutes and certainly from a programming standpoint, they're um, much more, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily say more valued, but they're more practical as far as programming goes. Right. Like um, you can decide between taking one 15 minute film versus five, three minutes films. And these films are usually flexible that you, they can be placed in any program or like even open for a feature. That being said, that might be discouraging of people making longer works of screen dance and might be. Um, potentially unintentionally uh, reinforce the idea that dance is something that's, you know, super long and unwieldy. So do you ever feel discouraged to create longer works of screen dance or is it? um... You know, I would say, just as you said, I would say it's, I'm not discouraged to create longer pieces of dance work and I would like to. I would say that if they were to be 15 minutes or longer than that, that they would have to be choreographed and cinematically shot in a way that was that was very, very well executed, I would think, um, versus something that's a little bit lower on production values um, where people might not take the work as seriously. Um, because specifically in Canada, I know most of you are, are from the U.S., but specifically in Canada, we used to have much more funding for lengthier pieces of screen dance work. But recently, which is what I wrote about in my article for The Dance Current, that a lot of the funding has been cut. Um, there are The National Film Board of Canada is still funding some longer pieces, which, for example, um, Philip Chaboyer and Marlene Miller at, in, in, at Concordia in Montreal oh, yeah. um, produce. Um, but so I would say I'm not discouraged per se, but I would feel that if I were to create a lengthier dance film that I would want it, I, everything would have to be nitpicked to perfection for me to put out something that was of that, qual- of that length. But yeah, I actually wanted to return back to the actual setting of the film that we see. So we okay. see the cabaret stage, um, which is very evocative of old Hollywood cabaret mm-hmm. scenes, um, the scenes often featuring women dancing suggestively for the camera and sort of, you know, for the purpose of the male gaze. Uh, Can you comment on the role of gender in the film and discuss the play on power dynamics and hierarchies within? So that's, I'm very glad you brought that up because that was, that was intentionally done that way. Just as you said, that old, that old style of stage, um, the location was specifically for that purpose. So I would say that that was really the intention of the title of the film, ID, Identity Crisis. Uh, I am myself, <laughs> to go very personal, I would say that I am openly gay. Um, so it was mainly playing a lot with my own gender, um, gender confusion that I was going through at the time. This, I mean, this film was made in 20. 20- 14 2015 um so it it was it was playing out my inner emotions um things that i wanted to play out in reality um i mean there are times for example like on halloween (laughs) where i i i take the opportunity um to i guess reveal myself or how i feel sometimes i take the opportunity to sometimes dress as a woman not every time but sometimes um so the so that was absolutely the intention to be very androgynous in my 
performance and my appearance in the piece. It was supposed to be more of a confused state. The, the, it was supposed to be of, uh, you know, is it a dude? Is it not a dude? <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. how, is the, how, how are they feeling, right? How is, right. The, the, mm-hmm. how is the talent feeling in the piece? Yeah. Right. And actually talking about the role of talent, that you play the role of the, the dancer as, yes. as well as the director of the film. Um, can you elaborate on the challenges of that? Yes, for sure. I would say that being the director and being the dancer and the choreographer of the piece, um, the challenge of playing all those roles is that I can't, being the dancer, I'm, I I don't have the ability to be behind the camera watching through it. So one of, So I guess the main challenge was perfecting the choreography to the point where I could trust myself while it was being filmed, that it was going to be, it, it, it would be perceived the way that I wanted it to be perceived in terms of the dynamics. Uh, I mean, because dance can, it, dance has all these little nuances. Um, it, it, if, if you want it to be, it can be very nitpicked. So just making sure that the perform, my performance was nitpicked to the point where I was comfortable not uh, I was comfortable with it being filmed because, again, I had the limit of the 60 millimeter film. Uh, you know, it, so I had to tr- get to the point where I trusted myself that everything uh, was perfect enough that I, it w- you know, little mess ups w- wouldn't be recorded. Um, but I guess also the other thing is I did have someone f- uh, at the location who helped me to do to the filming. They, I mean, they were just standing behind the camera to make sure everything looked okay. So the other problem that I had as well was articulating my vision of the piece to that person and making sure that they could see it the way that I could see it and making sure that they executed the way that I wanted them to execute it. But that's one of the things I think that makes for a very strong director, a very strong choreographer, is just being able to articulate your vision strong enough that the receiver can understand it and implement it the way that you want it to be implemented or Mm. executed. So we were just talking about how you're playing the role of choreographer, dancer, director, yet trying to get your vision to the person that stood behind the camera. Let's talk a little bit about some of these, um, these shots that you've chosen, which really, I think it comes down to two static shots. Yes. You've got your wide shot, and then you've got these really interesting unusually framed close-up shots. Right. And it's also very dark yeah. as well <laughs> in those ones. So a um, couple things we I noticed is the camera's placed in a way that does not look like an audience member would be. It looks like it's placed potentially higher. Right. But then you've got these really just, um, like, again, I said, very unusually placed, unusually framed close-up shots. Tell us a little bit about that and your choices in that so uh, going back to this spe- this theory of spectacle so i was taking um you, there you know there's an expression like being in your face right mm-hmm. but taking it to a literal um so the 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 very oddly framed shot where it's just like one spotlight on just on my face and everything else is dark so it's like I'm in your face, literally, and, like, that's the main focus of that shot. But also, you know, to intrigue the viewer by having my my head sort of, it's not really in the center. It's kind of off to the, I I think it's the right. Um, So, you know, it's playing with the traditional constructions of film, but then breaking them a little bit, right? Um, I would say that California Institute of the Arts is very um, is very supportive and encouraging of experimental filmmakers, um, and so I was taking a lot of the things that I had seen in my friends' work, um, and then applying them in a dance film context. Um, so, the idea of the camera placement um, being placed a little bit higher in the wide shots and a little bit lower on the close-ups, so. For the wider shots, I would say that they were placed a little bit higher to be, you know, to be honest, it was to to be closer to um, the placement of the spotlight, which was at the back of the, which was at the back of the room. So the spotlight, of course, has to be a little bit higher to 
fully frame the stage. Um, so it was more of, so again, playing on the idea of the spectacle and being in the spotlight, um, but also feeling what it's like, um, I guess not particularly from an audience perspective, but I don't want to say, I don't want to say it's uh, like, it wasn't like a downwards angle. It was more of like a head on angle. Right. Mm -hmm. So because the stage, it, the stage, that stage is like a little bit, it's, it's, it's like it's 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 higher up from the from the ground so the camera was more to be placed on my level which is why it's a little bit higher up but mm -hmm. it's the level of the stage if that makes sense mm -hmm. and then the other shot uh the like the the head shot a bad one i was off the stage so i was on the ground but the camera wasn't changed. It was, it, it was, well, actually, no. Like that, you were in the orchestra pit? Yes. Oh, got it. Yeah. yeah. The other thing I would add to that as well is, I don't know if you're familiar with any of the work by Carmen Amaya, who's a flamenco oh, yeah. dancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you look at a lot of her earlier films from the early 1900s, um, you, like there's a lot of there are a lot of shots like a lot of my shots were re were references to some of her films if you you can search them on youtube or whatever but so it, it was taking like these preconceived it was also taking um shots that had been that had been used in early dance films and then also trying to reuse them in in this film do you have any other uh films in the works right now in the <laughs> actually i do it's not a dance film though no. uh, it's it's a horror film uh and, <laughs> <laughs> and i'm shooting it as soon as i get back f f to toronto uh i'm shooting it next saturday yep next saturday oh wow so yeah so so but, but i would say that i also have other works in the uh, that are dance related so a friend a colleague of mine in my phd program at york we're working on a vr dance film oh, i think sweet. that's another area that i would really like to venture into because Absolutely. as a choreographer i'm also very curious as just like i mean it's such it, a vr camera is a very it's it, it's it's placed right in the middle of the action, right? So right. as a choreo I'm curious as a choreographer to play with choreography that's specifically designed for a 360 degree camera. Um, that's not just like a flat two dimensional proscenium arch type of view, but that mm -hmm. actually can the viewer can engage with on some level yeah, uh, I, with uh, their VR set. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm. I could talk for hours about dance's role in VR, but it's. I think that um, it really offers a chance, huge chance for democracy as far as like how you actually experience the film. It's like you are the main character essentially, yeah. and the action is really playing towards you. Exactly. Yeah. No. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I. I yeah. I. I would. Yeah. So I'm working on a VR film like that, but. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to also experiment with like d d um, numbers of dancers in VR films, you know, like a soloist, a duet, a trio, a quartet, 20 dancers, 50 dancers, and just experimenting like with, as I said, as a, as a choreographer, I'm very curious to see what the possibilities are in terms of choreography, but also, you know, as a viewer, when you're wearing a VR set, I mean, you're sort of just experiment you you yourself are sort of exper like just trying to um observe this world that you're immersed in mm -hmm. but i'm also interested to see what choreography can do to direct the viewer to certain to look at certain things at different times in the choreography so there's i'm very interested in a lot of that i would say right and there's yeah it's it definitely raises a lot of questions between like the relationship of the creator and the viewer. Right. Because in that case, the viewer has to be involved in the process. Exactly. They, they, they have exactly because they, yeah, no, for sure. Awesome. We've got two big questions. Okay. One question. Number one, what define screen dance for us? Okay. So that's a very, so that's a very good question. And that was one of the questions that I asked when I was producing the article for the dance screen. I asked all of my interviewers that question. Screen dance, I would say for me, I take a very broad approach, uh, as does Dr. Harmony Bench, as does Freya Olofsson, who's a professor at York. Um, 
So I think of, of screen dance can be anywhere from Hollywood musical dance number dance sequences in Hollywood musicals, like in La La Land, is a very recent example, uh, all the way to potentially dancer-ish movements. There was a film that was just literally just trees or flowers blowing in the wind, and there was a lot of that sparked a lot of debate as to what is screen dance because, I mean, is that screen dance? Is it not? So I would say that I view that as screen dance as well. I would also say that I also view like short five second dance films designed for Instagram as screen dance. So expanded screen dance. So not just screen dance that's designed for theaters or for a television screen, but screen dance that's just designed for all screens. So I would say that my definition of screen dance is the broadest that you can think of. Well, considering that broad definition, is there anything that you would not define a screen dance? You know, I think part of the definition of screen dance, and I've thought a lot about this as well, part of the definition of screen dance also comes from the intention of the director. Um, you know, is this intended to be a dance, or is this intended to look like a dance piece? Uh, are you visualizing it as a dance piece? Um, I would say that, you know, like just submitting a film to a festival where it's like a person running, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't, I would, I, I would have a debate about that as to whether that's screen is. I mean, it's movement, but is it like what, like that's not really intended choreographed movement per se, right? Uh, um, but I would say it would be a very rare occurrence for me to not consider anything screen is unless as long as it had some type of movement that looked like it was intentional, I would say. I, I, that's the best thing I can think of. That's the best articulation I can think of for that. Although part of my my doctoral dissertation was also going to be to try to narrow down the definition of screen dance because mm -hmm. there's so much debate on that. There's like, I but one scholar thinks this and one yeah. scholar thinks this and Douglas Rosenberg thinks that. And <laughs> stories Carmody, told yeah, by the body and stories yeah, not told Simon by the body. Simon Fields thinks this and Katrina <laughs> McPherson thinks that. And it's like part of my doctoral dissertation, I, I originally I thought about being a moderator for all of those ideas and maybe just like narrowing it down or maybe even just like categorizing it. So it's still screen ins, but it's, they're just more, they're just better organized in terms of the, like this is a screen ins film, but it's like, archival screen dance if you're filming like a live a live performance at the national ballet school of canada like it's still mm -hmm. a form of screen dance but it's like it's specifically filmed for archival purposes that you're going to show to educational purposes historical purposes rec rec um you know just for your own records Playing it's a very complex question and even for me when i was doing my interviews as i said for the dance current a lot of people to be honest with you couldn't answer that question oh, uh, and I, and question. I really narrowed it down too I said you know what do you think the definition of screen dance is in Canada and a lot of them sat there and they were like you know I don't really know I just kind of do my work it's screen dance but I haven't really thought a lot they haven't really thought themselves a lot about what it what makes something a screen dance work so it's mm -hmm. it's certainly a question that's been debated for the last five years and probably will continue to be yeah. <laughs> and, and i don't and as i said my definition is very broad just because i'm i'm open to anything and everything right. um yeah what dance filmmakers or works of screen dance have influenced you and how so i would say uh, i'm much more, I, i'm really a hollywood buff <laughs> So I really love Buzzard Berkeley. I love Stanley Donan. Uh, I love, um, uh, I, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, but I like Kenny Ortega's work. <laughs> Descendants. I just watched Descendants 3 last week with my son. Yes. Actually, I was referring to High School Musical. But... <laughs> and Newsies. Um, yep, yeah, Newsies, right. of course. The classics. Yep. Um, oh, I guess Damien Chazelle, who did oh, La La yeah. Land. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there, oh, man. There's another one who, uh, his name is escaping me, but he's done a lot of musicals for Disney. Uh, anyway, so I, I would say that a, lo a lot of my inspiration comes from watching Hollywood musical-style films. Um, but yeah, I would say my, my main one is Busby Berkeley. The non 
traditional, the non-popular would be Maya Darren, Loy Fuller. And then, of course, I have other influences from experimental film artists as well. But um, like some of my profs at California, at CalArts, um, who are pretty established in experimental films. Well, um, is there anything else that you would like to add about your film? And where can, where can people find you on the web? Oh, on, or on Instagram. On Instagram, my Instagram is at Turnbull George. No spaces, no periods, no underscores. It's just Turnbull, T U R N B U L L, George, G E O R G E. That's my Instagram. I, I, I don't really have a personal website. I guess my closest personal website would be my IMDb page. Um, or uh, I, I actually, I would say I, I do, a lot of my work is showcased on the Dance Currents website because I do a lot of writing for them. Uh, yeah, I would say that um, most of my recent work is, or my to be work is usually posted on the Dance Currents website. Uh, yeah, and then I don't really have a public YouTube channel or a public Vimeo channel. I, my, my bios are obviously on my school's website <laughs> for mm -hmm. my doctoral work. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. <laughs> that's excellent. Excellent. A few announcements this week. The San Suchi Festival of Dance Cinema is co-presenting its first event with Martha's Vineyard Film Society. There will be a live in-person screening at Martha's Vineyard Film Center on October 24th and a two-week virtual screening on Eventive starting on October 23rd. Visit sansuchisfest.org to learn more. Also, the Cinedanza Festival in Modena, Italy presents its three-day program this weekend from October 23rd to the 25th. The festival features screenings, artist presentations, and discussions, and will take place both in person at the Drama Teatro Theater and live streamed on the official Cinedanza YouTube channel. If you want to learn more about these festivals, the link will be in the show notes. We hope you enjoyed this discussion with George Turnbull. Thank you so much to George, Screen Dance Forum, and Cascadia Dance Cinema Festival for making this possible. To learn more about George, Screen Dance Forum, Dance Cinema, or this show, check out the show notes. Frameform is a production of Rixie, hosted by me, Hannah Weber, Claire Schweitzer, and Jen Ray. Edited and mixed by myself and Mason Carlton. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.